So thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, apologies that we've got a bit of a, um, a late start, but we got there in the end. We're here. Um, so we've got quite a few of you and some more filing in. So bear with us and uh, Phil will get connected shortly, I'm sure. Um, so the topic of this evening is all about when medication isn't working. Um, and that can be quite a a different topic for people. Uh, sometimes no medication is by choice. Sometimes um, not taking medication can be because there are other contraindications with other medications. So there's a lot that, that has to be taken into account as far as medication is concerned. Um, I'll talk from a personal perspective initially while Phil's sort of um, getting started here is, can you, no, I can't hear you Phil. Um, so when uh, my son was diagnosed with ADHD, um, I was actually very anti the label of ADHD. I didn't believe he had it. I, the, the school and the nursery uh, kept saying that he did. And I was adamant that he didn't. And so when we finally went through that, that diagnostic process, I was um, quite shocked, to be honest, because actually it was our normal. You know, ADHD in our house was normal, but, you know, he was the first person to be diagnosed. So um, when the, the topic of medication came up, um, I needed to know as much information as I could about it before putting, you know, a controlled drug into my son's system. So... Um, I went down a different avenue to begin with. I went down the holistic route. So we went to cranial osteopathy, um, which he absolutely adored. Cranial osteopathy was great. He used to fall asleep on the bed, um, cost an absolute fortune. Um, and I didn't actually see any huge benefits from it. The school hadn't reported back there were any benefits, but basically it works by aligning the, um, the platelets in, in the brain that are sort of hovering in this jelly-like substance. And it's thought that the way that it was explained to me was that, you know, if one of these platelets is out of sync, then that could have an effect on the, the brain from an ADHD perspective. So we did that for a while, didn't see an awful lot of benefit. Um, and then um, we tried everything from trampolining to judo, karate, scouts. Every, oh, is, every, is everybody, can, you can hear me. Sorry, I'm seeing messages come up. Oh, you can hear, okay. Okay, so I'm going to keep, keep going. Um, and Phil, are you, you still trying to connect? Yeah, can't hear. No echo here. Okay, but you can still hear me, I'm assuming. Okay, Sarah, thank you. You can hear, that's fine. So um, we tried everything um, to try and, you know, um, get his attention in class and it, it, nothing seemed to be working. And the one thing that did start to work were music lessons. And I'd read about the correlation between learning the piano or learning a musical instrument and how that might help with focus and attention. So we went to find a piano teacher who was so patient. And I think that's the key is finding a, someone who, who is really patient with your child. And she was absolutely amazing. And, um, he's, and we went for about 18 months and then the lesson stopped. And then he, he's, he brought the interest back up again. And for the last nine years, he's been going to piano lessons and he's doing music production at college. So we found that what Robert Brooks terms as his island of competence. And I know that Phil is, he knows an awful lot about this as well. Um, the islands of competence is like, what is your child's strength? So we sort of worked upon his strengths. What was his motivator? What, what I was just going to finish off with saying was that when we did decide to go down the medical route, um, I remember the morning that I gave Mason his medication and I was in tears because I, I, I was just so scared because I didn't know what this medication was going to do. You know, you hear all the horror stories about it. And I dropped him off at school and I'd, I'd be, me being me, as you know, Phil, I complete, I did this whole like A4 document that I wanted the teacher to complete throughout the day. Was he okay? Was he eating okay? Drinking this sort of thing. And I picked him up at the end of the day and his teacher handed me this A4 piece of paper, just like that. And, and he said, look, and it was a whole piece of paper Mason had written. I mean, bearing in mind he was six, 
he'd written a whole page of writing and he said prior to that all we'd had to do was keep prodding and poking him come on mate just to write his name so for him medication was the answer but as I was saying right at the beginning it isn't always the answer for everybody and we still put a lot of strategies in place to support the medication it isn't the only thing that we do it's not a case of take your pill your ADHD sorted there's a lot of scaffolding that has to occur to enable Mason to have a day where he's productive and doesn't procrastinate and he's feeling good about himself if I jump in there what a great mm. opportunity for me to jump in and I think that's basically the theme of what we're going to talk about what we are talking about isn't it is is if medication doesn't work for you or you're frightened of it or you've got medication what else can help um what what else is there out there and why why is that really important for people with, with ADHD and as you say Mason and I've heard him play the keyboard and it's extraordinary um how a young man who couldn't focus on anything can now focus and that island of competence and I know you said Phil's Phil's got a passionate interest in that I I really have and and if we can unlock that island of competence we start to actually see a change in overall behavior of somebody with ADHD his motivation and, and all those other things don't we and Kristen and I were talking earlier and um we were talking about the therapeutical benefit of finding that something that really turns you on that really gets you going that's positive and um I was talking about Lego and um, Kristen just suddenly went, yeah, Lego. Yeah. We've got every bit of Lego in the house that is humanly possible to have. And I know that many a patient we talk to who can't focus and can't concentrate at all. Um, we, we, all of a sudden can follow the instructions in a Lego um, set and sit and build a, a, a Lego Ferrari, for instance, for nine hours and and we see an incredible amount of focus and it i introduced that into the conversation beth because we're going to talk about scaffolding and structure and all those things but the living proof is mason with his keyboards the, the people i've been talking to about lego it's finding the something mm -hmm. that can actually start to really change how we look at life and 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 Kristen and I went on to talk about it's that immediate reward that you can get from building Lego, that satisfaction mm. and that that general feeling of wow, I have just accomplished something, reading instructions, working it out, following it. And and it just to me embodies what we're trying to achieve with the non-medical interventions mm. is bringing that feeling of self-esteem, that worth, that value. Um, and bringing that into people's lives and mm. whether it's keyboards um, many of our patients are addicted to exercise aren't they and <laughs> you, you, you know we've talked Bev you and I about addiction and it's almost a negative word addiction but actually um, if we can find the addiction that's a positive addiction mm. and we need to keep searching with some people we need to really keep going around it time and time again um, we can actually start to actually get people's um, chemicals in the brain running on a more positive note, topping up any medication or replacing it as much as humanly possible and mm. give them a feeling of self-worth and value. What, what, what do you find with, what do you find with the people that you're coaching and working with in that regard then? I find that um, what we have to find is the motivator. Everybody has a motivator, that thing that gets them out of bed every single day and gets them moving and it's funny I was talking to um, a client this, mo this, this morning we were talking about motivators and I said I always remember one of my first jobs was um, you, you know you were at a set pay scale and then to get the next pay increment you had to complete this qualification and that qualification to be able to, to achieve it so for me, that was my motivator because I wanted that pay bump. And then when I got to the top of the scale and there wasn't any pay bumps after that, I started to lose interest in the job because, mm -hmm. because it's like, well, what, what's next? And that's the thing with us. We, we need that carrot, that, that dopamine fuel, if you like, that makes us just want to do the thing and get the thing done to fruition. And, you know, for some people that can be... Um, 
like from an addictive, addictive perspective, it can be game playing, you know, yeah. going online, playing PlayStation, Xbox. That is a dopamine fuel, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah. For some people. Well, it's that, it's that classic, isn't there? Why can my child focus on their Xbox for two and a half hours, but they can't focus on their maths assignment? Well, that's because the maths yeah. assignment's chuffing boring and <laughs> giving them no reward. But it is, isn't it? It doesn't motivate them. And what, what, what we need to do, perhaps, is, is change the way that we educate so that we actually um, are motivating people and actually getting them gripped by their education and you know, the, the, a lot of the work we do with Connections in Mind and, and Victoria from Connections in Mind keeps on saying and, and ruthlessly saying, we can't educate everybody the same way and people who are neurodiverse mm-hmm. need a different way. And those teachers that can lock into somebody's passion and get that motivation going um, are, are the ones that will actually get the child with, with, with their ADHD to succeed. I noticed, Beth, probing as I do, that you've got you've got a board behind you yeah. And, and we're talking about structure and we're talking about scaffolding. If we move beyond motivation for a minute to get into a different subject matter, um, you're, you're a great advocate of, of the Kanban board, aren't you? And, and, mm. and br- how that can bring structure into the self-actualized individual's life. Mm. I'd, I'd, be, I'd, I'd be really excited to hear you, and I've heard you many times, but I still get excited, and I've seen you help people with it. Yeah. Talk to talk to talk to our audience about the use of a board as a visual project management, life management tool. Yeah. Do you know what? It's one of the most simplest things that you can do. And you don't need to have a whiteboard like this. You don't need to have little magnetic um, things like this. You can do it with post-it notes. And actually, traditionally, the Kanban system is using post-it notes. So what you do is you have a to-do column. So this would be your items that you're going to do. So at the beginning of the day, you would list your tasks or chores that you need to do throughout the day. And then when you're working on one in particular, only one at a time, you drag it across. So I'm going to be working on that one. So that's in my in progress column. We'll put that back there. That's in my in progress column. Then when I've completed that task, I move it across to the completed column. So it's there's such a, such a simple thing. But what it causes is a dopaminergic reaction. What we're doing is our dopamine is actually getting a bit, we're having a high five in our head. The cheerleaders are going, wait, go Bev. You've completed all these tasks today. And that is the simplicity of it. It sounds really simple, but it does really work. And there's another way that you can do it. You can do it online on your computer. There's a can, it's called the Trello board. And some of you might have heard of the tre- yeah someone's just put yeah, up Lucy's, a, yeah, Lucy's just picked that up. yeah yeah um it, it works on exact exactly the same premise now this is here for demonstration purposes so if i'm coaching a client or you know like today i thought it might be interesting but i actually have a bigger whiteboard over on the other side of the office so i get up and i move i get up and so getting up and moving is actually increasing the adrenaline in my body which actually goes up the spinal cord, stimulates my dopamine up here in my frontal lobe. So that actual act of moving, so I've, I've done this, I've completed it, a little bit of a dopamine rush. I've gone over there, you know, and, and moved it on my board. So I'm actually increasing my dopamine as well. And I'm getting that movement. Movement is so important with ADHD. And what you're also getting is that visual sense of satisfaction, aren't you? You know, it's, yeah. not, about, it's not about words, it's about a visual product that is giving yeah. you that, that opportunity to see things and yeah. see your own progress, reward yourself, and then get that mm. secondary rush, if you will, from, from the reward of, of having that, that structure to your projects and, and, mm. and, and your tasks. I mm. guess, I guess the, it kind of segues for me into, um, I, I, try, I tried with somebody um, a few months ago sort of saying, well, you won't forget an appointment if you put an alarm on your phone, Phil. I've tried that, and all that happens is when the alarm goes off, I dismiss it, and then forget that I've dismissed it, and and I've moved on. <clears throat> and it kind of outlines the complexity of what we're dealing with. That some of the standard life models of how to manage things don't work so much for somebody mm. with with ADHD in particular, and and mm. we have to keep finding new ways, new mechanisms of. of of making things work and and i know your your board there um is a really good one 
I'm going to pick on you again. It's almost as if we planted these things, but it's just the professionalism Uh (laughs) that you bring in. No, 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 no. It's the professionalism you bring to the table is, of course, you've got your um, your, your countdown clock, your ADHD clock on the wall there. Talk, Talk to everybody about that because that's a magnificent device. Yeah. So this is a time timer and you can get small desk sized ones, like little handheld ones to go on the desk. But this is great because I can actually see that time reducing. You know, when we've got that, you know, we get time blindness, don't we, with ADHD. We get sucked down into the wormhole of hyper focus and get in on a task. But if we've got something visual in front of us. So if I'm on a Zoom call and I'm with a client. I can actually see that reducing. But what it also does is for the for the client or the patient, whoever I'm talking to, they can see it. They, they're aware of the time as well. And it just helps you keep on task, helps you stay to time. Um, now, you have to be careful with these because some people will get anxious. Some people get anxious with the time aspect. Then they might look at it and think, oh, I've only got 40 minutes or I've only got 30 minutes or five minutes left. But actually, um, for some people, it can be a huge positive. For me and my son, it's the best thing. You know, I use that from the Pomodoro technique. So if I'm doing some work, <laughs> sorry, but if I'm if I'm doing some work, I'll do 25 minutes of work and I'll use my little handheld one of these. And then I will walk away from the desk for five minutes walking again, stimulating the dopamine with the adrenaline, getting that movement, stretching, having a drink, having a quick snack to sort of, you know, um, just refresh my brain. You know, you, you forget to drink with ADHD. So common. Um, so things like that are just such a bonus when it comes to, you know, avoiding procrastination because that's what the Pomodoro technique does as well. Yeah, yeah. And as you say, it's almost as if this is a, there's a plan here. And of course, there isn't a plan. This is the beauty of these webinars is we start, we, we throw a pebble in the pond and see where the ripples go. Um, so just as you said, Pomodoro technique, somebody wrote, somebody wrote in the comments, it's like the Pomodoro technique. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I, I nearly burst out laughing. Um, and you introduced something else there. And, and if we're talking about what more is there than medicine and and you know so everybody's clear we're adhd 360 is very much an advocate of medical intervention is is a good way of starting things off but it's not everything for everybody and there have to be alternative ways of either topping up your medicine therapy or if you can't tolerate medicine or you just don't want it what else can we do rather than feeling abandoned and 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 mm. um and and i'm um, you know there is a lot more to do so i'm gonna i'm gonna bring you back to you just talked about hydration and water um mm. but somebody's just said just give us two minutes on the pomodoro technique before we okay. go into um nutrition hydration and those kind of things yeah cool no problem so the pomodoro technique works on the premise so pomodoro is i think it's italian for tomato isn't it it's tomato timer um so you would work for 25 minutes of solid work and no no interruptions and then you have a five minute break you then come back you do another 25 minutes five minute break so in essence you do four lots of 25 minutes four pomodoros with five minute breaks in between and then on the last one you take a half hour break sort of 25 minutes half an hour so on that longer break The idea is that, you know, maybe you'll do something more extensive than just a a quick walk into the kitchen and grab a drink and a snack. You might do some mindfulness, some meditation, a meditative walk. I know how challenging meditation can be for people with ADHD. Trust me, I've got it and I've tried it. And it's even guided meditations can be a real challenge. But even just going for a walk and listening to some music, that's being mindful. Just, you know, getting away from the area that you're in then coming back and then getting on with more work. Now, if you've got a child with ADHD who's not taking medication, reduce that 25 minutes. So during lockdown, we were using this um, an awful lot with my son completing his schoolwork. We would do 15 minutes, 15 minutes, five minute break, 15 minutes, five minute break. And that just, it helped his focus. He got a better quality work. There might not have been as much quantity, but the quality of work was so much better um now there is an app that you can get um and it's called uh, bft the bare focus timer um and it's on your phone and it's literally um like a bear 
that comes up and it's got a, um, a timer in there. And you can select the time, whether it's 10, 15, 25 minutes. You put your phone down and it will play a white noise. And white noise is brilliant to help with focus and concentration. It's also really good if you're trying to get to sleep and you have sleep issues. Um, and then what that white noise does, it drowns out all the external stimuli that's going on. So if you're in a work environment or you're, you're at home and there's cars going by or the noisy neighbours, um, and it helps you get on with your work. And it also sort of stops the calls coming through the phone and the messages. The minute you pick it up, it shows you that you've got, I don't know, another 15 minutes left. And it's not until you put it down and you finish those 15 minutes will it allow you to have that break. I mean, obviously you can bypass it, but you, the, the idea is that you're going to be good and not cheat like me, because I do tend to cheat at things. It's called the BFT, the Bear Focus Time. Yeah, someone's put it up there, the Bear Focus Timer. And I love it. It's a really good little app. Is that, is that a good overview, Phil? Yeah, 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 brilliant. Um, <laughs> do you know what? Someone's asked the question, do, do ADHD 360 support people who, who don't take medication? And, and, you know, I'm going to be brutally honest about the growth in our organisation and our thinking, because I think if we don't always look to grow, change, think and, and develop them, then, then we're failing. What, what, what The position statement for our organisation is we're not interested in diagnosing people and then doing nothing to help them because that just becomes a little bit bonkers for me. A diagnosis is a ticket, but it's a ticket to where there's no journey, there's no ride, there's no return. Um, whereas either medical interventions or interventions through um, through Bev's work, and we're building a team around Bev um, of non-medical interventions, either complementing medicine or, or if there is a reason why medicine can't be can't be tolerated taken or isn't in vogue for that for that patient that there is still an intervention to help there is still effort to change and 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 what have you and um i i was in conversation with a with a parent a couple of months ago who said i only want my child assessing and if possible diagnosing i don't want to change anything for them and we drilled into it and what they wanted was extra time for exams at school and I said, well, without any techniques or medicine to help, the hour, the painful hour of an exam becoming an, an hour and a half for an exam is only more pain. Um, you've got to start building either techniques through coaching and, and the work that Bev does or through medicine. You've got to have something as a set of interventions to help. So in answering that question that came up in the QA, um, yeah, we are really supportive, but we do want people to not just have the ticket to say I've got ADHD it's about wanting to do something so that we can support positive set of interventions and start to make a difference and um and 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 on that note I'm going to start to talk about why hydration and food makes a difference and Bev we, you and I worked on a piece a couple of weeks ago didn't we where we had the mm. the triangle that you 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 and I worked on and um and it comes into it comes into the whole regime of if not medicine what else you know, we've got you've got to have a decent sleep hygiene and a sleep pattern. You've got to have exercise, but you've got to have your diet right to, to start helping. And and you produced a great uh, a great piece of work, um, which which is there and readily available, all about diet. And um, we've just introduced into our onboarding questions for any patient. Um, we've just interviewed uh, introduced a load of questions about caffeine intake. Um, and, and it's so easily missed, isn't it? How mm. excess caffeine, that becoming the addiction, that becoming the thing that's changing what's going on in here. Um, and um, caffeinated Coca-Cola, Pepsi, energy drinks. My energy goodness, drinks. the amount of, oh. patients who, the amount of patients who are battering their bodies with energy drinks and Monster and, and Red Bull and mm. stuff like that. And, um, and we're very clear that, that isn't a good way of managing the whole process. So talk to us about diet a little bit, Bev, mm -hmm. and, and breakfast and lunch and all of those difficulties and challenges you've had mm -hmm. with yourself, with other patients and children and all that kind of stuff. Mm. So with, with I'll, I'll sort of talk from Mason's perspective because he's the one that we made a really big drastic change on his diet. Um, so we, we found that when he was taking his medication, we found that he obviously inhibited his appetite. So during the middle of the day, he would just not eat anything. And then we'd end up, he'd come home and he'd have a bit of tummy ache and he'd be ravenous. And, 
um, ended up sort of gorging on food. So what I did was I just woke up one morning. I said, you know what? I'm going to switch the breakfast. I'm just turning breakfast upside down. So what we did was, and, and what we still do now, he's 19 now. So in the mornings, he will have a, a protein, high protein breakfast. So he will have a piece of fish. He will have, if, if there's steak in the fridge and his dad's not eating it and he doesn't know any better, he'll have a bit of steak um, or turkey breast, chicken breast, whatever it might be. Um, he'll have some whole wheat pasta or some uh, brown rice and vegetables. So whether that's, be, uh, you know, string, stringless beans, he likes carrots, broccoli um, and a fruit smoothie. That is the basis of his breakfast every single day. I get up at six and I make sure he's out the door at seven. So he has this cooked breakfast. And what that does is that just feeds his body slowly throughout the day. Obviously, the, the carbs, slow release carbs with the pasta. Um, and then he might have some snacks in his bag, like some dried fruit or um, something just to tide him over till he gets home. And then he'll have dinner as soon as he gets in from college. Um, and for us, oh, literally overnight, we had there wasn't any phone calls from the schools from the school nurse saying, can you come pick him up? He doesn't feel well. He's got tummy ache and things like that. And, um, you know, it, it was just an epiphany for us. And he put on weight. He managed to stay to sustain his weight and actually put on weight, you know, um, as well as taking his medication. So for, for us, it, it was a huge game changer. And even when he doesn't take, cause there are days when he doesn't take his meds, um, he, he will still keep that diet up. You know, it still forms a, forms part of his breakfast, his daily routine. It, it's it's quite amazing. And I'm looking at the comments here, um, you know, and, and, and yeah, building on that slow release, um, high protein. It's a healthy diet as well. And, and the links between the brain and the body are, are incredible, aren't they? And, um, mm. you know, the, the, the we've become a snatch and go eating community, haven't we? And I think when we talk to our patient groups and our patients, we see that the, 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 the lack of effective planning of diet is, is, is a big issue. And therefore mm -hmm. having someone, a lad like Mason, having you there to do that for him, it's very difficult for him to do that for himself. And yeah. when he gets into older life, we're going to have to have coping mechanisms there. And co coaching one parent of a, of a 19 year old lad, and you're working with him as well. Now mm -hmm. it, it was about, Going, go, going to bed the night before, but leaving something in the fridge for him. One, for him to have when he comes down with the munchies. And secondly, that his breakfast is there. So it might be a piece of chicken and some cheese or whatever it is. And, and it's there ready. Because the alternative is to grab something really unhealthy or to go past McDonald's and pick up a McDonald's mm. breakfast. And it, it's about, it's the prep and the planning mm. of, yeah. of that, 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 that significant other that significant influence to help that um, to help that that become the norm and to mm. break that addiction. So the addictive cycle of fast food or fast lifestyle uh, is broken by somebody actually helping, whether it's a girlfriend, boyfriend, parent, grandparent, um, or, or anything like that. And I've ignited a whole flame of commentary here because I mentioned the, the golden arches. Just leave the <laughs> golden arches. Just leave the golden arches alone, for God's sake. Um, you know, and 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 we really have to, we ha really have to help by by accepting that impulsivity, procrastination, and all those other things do not lead to planning a diet. They do not mm. lead to planning your Tesco shop or your your your, 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 your supermarket sweep. That, so we've got to have help in that regard to make sure that the diet is acceptable and it is functional mm. because otherwise we're just in trouble and we and we resort to to junk food. Mm. And I'm going to come back to caffeine. No, go on, Beth, please. What I was going to say was that we also had the added issue that, that he was diagnosed with autism a few years after his ADHD. And there were a lot of foods that he would not try. He was very resistant. So yeah. it was a case of trying lots of things. We went gluten free. For a couple of years cost us an absolute fortune from a gluten-free perspective but I was willing to try anything to support him but it, it didn't make any difference at all and when we put him back on food with gluten 
we didn't see anything significant. Um, but I think there's also that link and there's a lot of research into the gut biome, isn't there? The, 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 the microbiota that's in the stomach and that there's this, and I, I don't know, the research can be a little bit tenuous and I know it's been going on for a few years that, you know, that the brain is connected by the vagus nerve. So what we actually ingest, what we're eating actually comes up the vagus nerve into our brain and actually, you know, those toxins of the food that like if we're eating lots of food coloring and I actually watched um the connections in mind had a brilliant uh, webinar last night all about food and ADHD uh -huh. so I was listening to that really intently because you know it was like reducing sugar which is a huge problem for us we love carbs people with ADHD yeah. we are carb monsters because it's that quick fix isn't it gives us yeah. our dopamine a big rush you know give me a piece of Marks and Spencer sprinkle cake and I'm I'm away, you know, uh, but it's not good for me. And I know that. So, yes. Yeah. And what about water? The whole hydration thing, because mm. we, we, we get that we get the whole hangry thing. If someone who's neuro neurotypical um, starts to to actually not have um, enough water and hydration, you put hangry on top of anxiety, on top of um, all those other things that are going on for someone with ADHD, and and we we feel that change, don't we? We we mm. feel that, and and you know the advent of the modern day chili bottle, water bottle. We we've got we've got them at work for all the team at work, because we have to be hydrated, and if we're not, um, we've got some severe problems with focus and concentration and even mm. behaviour. Um, how do you get around that one to get get keeping hydrated is that an alarm on the phone is that uh, a visual memory of do you start with a two liter bottle and you've got to drink it all in the day you know there's all those tricks are out there aren't they do you know what this is my go-to this is my avon <laughs> this is my avon little individual water carafe and i feel I that for i didn't know you i didn't know you had that <laughs> yeah literally i feel this four times a day this, I, I, in the morning, I come into the office and I, I make sure I have four of these before I leave at the end of the day. That is my goal. So whether I have to chug a bit more, you know, as the day goes on, I will always make sure I've got that. Because I've tried, I had Alexa. Alexa was on there. And, mm. oh, sorry, she's listening. Um, so every sort of half an hour, I'd get a little time off, but she got annoying. And I ended up just switching it off completely. But if I've got it visually in front of me, which it is yeah. right here by the desk, yeah. I'm more liable to keep drinking. And I know my brain starts to get foggy. I'm not focusing. I, sometimes it gets to the point where I have a headache. So having something visual really helps. And it is that visual link in this in this part, isn't it? In, in, yeah. And if someone just says to you, remind yourself to have a drink of you, you, you've said, you know, other electronic devices, um, not always going to work because you can afford to ignore them, but that visual thing stays in front of you, doesn't it? And, yeah. and you know, it, 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 it's there, it's visual. And, and visual is what plays into the world of ADHD, isn't it? it mm. You know, and I'm thinking right back now, we, we, we've been on this, we're at a slight slow start. We were on this for 35 minutes now. We've talked about the visual Kanban board. Your clock is ticking, yeah, we have, yeah. Your clock is ticking away, the red section's becoming less... Um, we're talking about visual reminders to, to hydrate. Um, and as Paula saying, she hates drinking water. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I, I'm with you, especially warm water. I can't abide it, Laura. But um, we've got to have something to say, stay hydrated. And these visual references or um, someone else was talking about a soda stream um, and, and all those, whatever it is that's working, you, you've got to find, it goes back to right at the very start, what's the motivator, where's the motivation mm -hmm. coming from, visual references, structure, scaffolding, um, consistency, that's the word that's often missed in, in, mm -hmm. in the dialogue about ADHD is, is consistency. And I was, mm -hmm. I was coaching a parent yesterday who felt that she'd let her son down because he, he hadn't done well with something. And when we explored it, she, she hadn't been consistent and she was struggling with a busy life to be consistent for her for a mm. child, 19 year old, and struggling to be consistent. But ultimately, we've got to have somebody in our lives that can help us with that consistency mm. so that things mm -hmm. then become a pattern and that pattern becomes motivational and that motivation becomes a recharge and that recharge mm. becomes chemically driving, doesn't it? And, mm. you know, we, we, we talk about, we talk about all those things. I think what this session is 
hopefully do for people is just stimulating some ideas. And if everybody took one idea away um, to change and, and was consistent with that idea, um, mm. and, and someone else has just introduced alcohol into the mix, um, mm. you know, um, and, and, and alcohol is there to be enjoyed. I don't drink. Bev doesn't drink. That's coincidence. But it's a it it we've got to introduce moderation into things as well, haven't we? Mm. Um, mm. Especially the things that have have risk. Mm. If we, but if we come away from diet for a second, Bev, let's talk about exercise. And you talked about every time in terms of uh, managing time. Every time you get that break, you can get up and you physically walk to the other side of the room to move that that piece across mm -hmm. on your big big dry whiteboard. Um, I, I recall um, many moons ago starting a, pa a parent support group in East Lancashire um, and to make it viable, it was of an evening, um, to make it viable, we got some sports coaches and trained them on ADHD specific sports and they took the family's kids for the hour that the families were getting together for the, for the, um, for the support group and within just two weeks we found it was the children bringing the adults to the support group, not the, not the adults bringing the children. And the reason for that, when we looked at it, was because we trained the sports coaches to to give the, the kids specific exercise, games, sports, in a sports hall that respected their ADHD. And, mm. and I've, long used, I've long used rounders as an example of a poor ADHD sport. And, and and people, some people will have heard, you know, someone's just questioned ADHD specific sports. Yeah. And rounders doesn't make it on the list. If you ask a <laughs> child with ADHD to queue up behind six other people and wait for their turn. And when they get to the front of the queue, give them a great big baseball bat to hit something with. You can guarantee two things are going to happen. One, it's unlikely to be the ball because their, their motor skills might not be up to speed. And secondly, the last thing they're going to want to do is they're going to want to hit the person who's been in the queue before them as opposed to hitting the ball. And you, you, Just that frustration of waiting and queuing. So the sports we did, non-contact rugby or tag rugby or running and, and running up and down and climbing wall bars and all those kind of things that actually take kids outside and give them something to do. You know, where are you with exercise these days? Not you personally, Dave, I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of coaching and advocating for exercise, because I know you and I share all these common agendas. What, what's, what's, what's the latest advice you're giving there as, as a national expert? Mm. Ex uh, exercise is, is paramount. It's absolutely paramount. I mean, uh, my son, he has a, he's got a home gym upstairs in, in one of the spare rooms. Every single day he's working out, even before bed he does it, because it actually helps him sleep. Because what yeah. he's doing is he's exerting that hyperactive, that energy, that kinetic energy that's built up during the evening since he's got back from college. Because you've got to think, you know, our children are sort of sat in schools for, what, six hours a day, sometimes longer with college. My son gets you know, travel to and from. So by the time he gets home, nine hours on average of sitting. So he needs to expend that energy. Um, I personally think there isn't enough PE in schools. It should be every yeah. single day. It's not just yeah. a Monday and a Wednesday thing. There should be exercise every day in incremental sort of breaks throughout. Um, I know that there was a, one of our primary schools had something called Wake Up, Shake Up. And it were these DVDs that they did at the beginning of every lesson and it was literally something like, uh, you know, Queen's, you know, um, We Will Rock You or something. But there were dance routines that went with it. And you could see the children were energised. You know, their brains were like, they woke up, they were active, they were ready to do some work because they knew that in another 50 minutes they'd be doing another song. It's the best thing I ever saw. Yeah. Um, but I, I think exercise, you know, literally getting away from the, the, the desk if you're a desk bound person getting away from it and actually just even if it's walking around the block walking up the street to the shop and back as long as you're not going to go and get any naughty food um you know it's it's just actually that movement is stimulating that adrenaline stimulates the dopamine and helps focus and funny enough I was talking to someone one of my coaching clients yesterday and we were having a chat about this and he said I've noticed Bev that after you said to me 
Um, Because I said to him, when you're doing exercise, do you find that you're able to have a really good conversation with someone or, you know, you can respond to questions? He went, yeah. And he actually, he came back this week. He said, Bev, I actually did it. I noticed it. I was more observant. And I noticed that, yeah, I'm more more with it I'm more able to be more reasonable with responses because he's exerting this energy and stimulating this dopamine yeah and 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 it's so evident and I quite like to walk in a meeting um you know and I'll say nice day I say come on we'll 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 do this outside we'll go for a walk and 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 Mm -hmm. chat chat things through um it's really interesting watching the chat here you know, yeah. you, you know i'm trying to keep um, up with it <laughs> well i know it, it just went it, 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 it went really wild then but if the the, the, the sports are just, someone's saying cycling less impactful on your knees and your legs than, than running running walking mm. cycling swimming rollerblading um someone mm. said you, you can you can do rounders for adhd if you can make the accommodations yes you can yeah 100 yeah. percent you can but if you ask somebody to wait in a queue that's not going to work um yeah you know it's it's a dsm question can you cope mm. standing in a queue so putting sport on that that, that brings that about is mm. is not gonna is not gonna happen um so so all those sports if you, th- if you think about that something just recapping where we are we've gone through all of those sports that that, that and, and the benefits of sport and the ben- how it helps you think, how it helps you focus and, and, and concentration. We've talked about visual references for tasks and that structure of having that Kanban board or, or something similar. We've talked mm. about hydration and a visu- visual representation of how you are or you aren't taking in liquid. And, and you know, people would say, people would say, well, what can you do other than medicine well you know again i'm going to say it medicine is a key there's no doubt about it medicine is a key but then you've got all these other things that can help you and 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 i i would typically and still do typically describe this as a hundred units of improvement medicine can give you 80 the other 20 is bev's world it's the food it's the structure Mm. it's the scaffolding it's exercise it's understanding yourself now that you're the new you with medicine this doesn't have to be an alternative conversation does it It doesn't have to be a conversation of conflict that one's better than the other it, mm. it, it, it's 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 literally about what is um what is going to work for the individual to try and get them as close to that 100 units of available mm. growth i was mm. i was with somebody the other day who um cannot play the drums to save their life but is now really enjoying playing the drums badly because it actually is a break. It's an exercise. It, it's it's mm. hard work. It makes you sweat. And the, 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 in there, have they got rhythm? Have they got... No, they haven't. Can they move the left foot, the right foot, the left hand, the right hand, all independently? No, they can't. But are they enjoying it? Absolutely, mm. they are. And we don't have to be a craftsman with musician and the arts, as long as we can enjoy it and we can get something out of it. And, yeah. you know, we're talking about it at our company summer event, having some ADHD artists there um, to actually explore with us and, and, and expand the virtues of creativity in ADHD. And that, and that I'm hopping us right back to the very start of the island of competence and the motivators. We, if we can find that trigger, if we can find that single thing that actually turns it all on, we're, we're halfway there, aren't we? Mm, um, definitely. I think as well, it's, it's having a, a positive or a growth mindset you know yeah. I, I use the word positive tenuously because you know but but having a growth mindset towards things so there might be things that you know you can't do now you're not competent at you know to the level that you want to be because I know from a personal perspective if I go on to something um like Pinterest and I see a, a craft activity and I think oh I really want to have a try of that. I'll go on Amazon. I'll get all of the resources for it. It will arrive. I'll sit there. I'll lay it all out. I'll do it. And it doesn't look anything like the thing on Pinterest. I give up. But whereas, yeah. you know, um, you know, having that growth mindset is, okay, I might not be able to do it now, but if I keep having a go at it and come back to it, I might get better and improve. And, and actually that increases the dopamine as well. So, you know, having that growth mindset, I think, is, is really important. Um, and knowing that we can't be good at everything but like you said if you can enjoy it if you get an enjoyment yeah. from it that means yeah. everything and it's relaxing yeah. you know yeah absolutely one of one of the uh, one of the, one of the attendees just put in the chat um how they miss their drums and, and again working with somebody late last week who, who now um 
gets a pair of drumsticks, crouches down, and pretends to play the drums to their favourite tunes for 10 minutes. Brilliant. And they haven't got a drum kit. They never will have a drum kit. But they're moving their arms and flinging these sticks around and trying their best to hang on to them. And playing the visual drums in their mind, if, you, if that makes any sense. And mm. getting a sweat on, getting that dopamine rush going. Get, and, and, yeah, in their words, I feel like I look like a right pillock. But actually getting something out of it. Does it matter if you look like a right pillock? I don't think it does. But yeah. in a 10-minute break between tasks or between meetings or between chores or whatever it is, picking up just pick up two blooming wooden spoons and pretend that you're playing the drums to your favorite tune. These are things that can be done and they are form part of that important triangle of supporting yourself with good sleep, good food, and 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 um, good diet. Let, 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 let's just have two minutes on sleep, that other part of our triangle, Bev, if we can. You know, mm. we, talk, we talk about sleep hygiene and how important that is for everybody. Um, mm. What are the key factors that we talk about in terms of being able to get to sleep and then also being able to maintain your sleep? Because that's as important, isn't it? Uh, oh sorry yeah it is absolutely I mean as I said earlier personally I have to have white noise playing in the background because that allows all of the thoughts in my head of what went on during the day what I'm doing tomorrow what's happening at the weekend it just dissipates that it it drowns all of that out and it allows me to have a good sleep but one of the things that used to work I don't have a bath anymore unfortunately in my house we have showers but um, Epsom salts Epsom salt baths because they've got that natural magnesium in them they actually relax all the muscles in the body it's that the, the marathon runners use it so after they've just done their 27 miles of running it relaxes all those muscles and it does really help I mean I could literally sleep all through the night without getting up which is quite rare for me at the time um, but having that that sleep prepares you for the next day if you're having lack of sleep upon lack of sleep it compounds and after a while you'll lose attention you'll lose focus the irritability the emotional dysregulation kicks in so if you're in your workplace if you're having to go and work with you know a team of people you you might notice your tolerance levels are lower um you might notice that your um you know, if someone comes to you with a bit of critiquing, you take it more personally than you normally would. You know, that rejection sensitivity sort of kicks in yeah. more than it probably would have done. Yeah. So yeah. sleep is essential. Yeah. yeah, we can't manage without sleep. We, we, we can't. And, and, and I think they talk about ba bathing, Epsom salts, exercise. And there's that classic. And it's a bit it's a bit old hat now. But I think it's still there to be talked about is um you know, blue light on your phone, on an iPad before trying to get mm. to bed. It, it doesn't work. It, it's clinically proven. It doesn't work. It doesn't relax mm. you. And then um, Lisa, who couldn't make it tonight, and I, we did um, we did a sleep seminar with um, a consultant from a hospital in London who was a who was a consultant in the NHS on sleep, and um, and and he was really really um, engaging but passionate about sleep hygiene and he, and he this will this will go one or two ways now but i'm going to say what he said so i'm going to i'm quoting somebody else um so, so don't shoot the messenger but he said the bedroom is for two things it's for sleep and sex and it should be for nothing else if you're going to read before bed do it in a chair and then get up and go to bed if and if you're going to watch the telly or play on your phone leave it out of the room and then go in the bedroom to sleep and he was, he would, and I sort of challenged him on that. I said, yeah, you know, I, I quite like to read in bed. He said, yeah, but if you get into your book, you can find it stimulating. And, you, you know, you've got a problem. And he says, what we've got to do is get people to understand what sleep hygiene is all about. Make sure your bedroom is free from drafts, free from noise, and, and so on and so on, so you can maintain your sleep. And and I'm noticing um, some of the comments there, um, some of them are quite distracting, but I noticed some of the comments that, um, and I think it's humanly possible to reset your, your, your circadian rhythm. And, and if your body is out of rhythm with your sleep and you're finding you're not getting sleep till two o'clock in the morning, but you've got to be up at eight o'clock to go to college work or school or whatever it is, you've got to reset that clock. And there are certain things you can do and, and melatonin helps as well short term to reset that clock. And we should never, um, 
we should never lose sight of the fact that we've got to get on top of our sleep hygiene as much as anything else, mm. haven't we? Um, yeah, you, you brought up a really good point, actually, uh, which reminded me about reading or watching programmes. My top tip for, for that is to never always stop reading halfway through a chapter and always stop if you're if you're a box set binger like me for Netflix or Amazon, stop halfway through the program. Don't wait till the end for the cliffhanger. Because yeah. if you wait to the cliffhanger, you want to go on to the next episode. And the next is one. Next one. Yeah. yeah. Stop yeah. halfway yeah. through. It's it's it sounds so obvious when you discuss it, doesn't it? But you you're absolutely right. And 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 um you know that takes discipline, doesn't it? But it's there to yeah. be done. I'm, yeah. I'm aware that Kristen, our regu- regulator and, 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 and monitor t- today, will be saying, right, we're at eight o'clock. And, um, you know, I just want to, if I can, Bev, recap where we've gone. And uh, first mm. of all, I'm, the, the first recap thing is to apologise for a shaky start, um, localised flooding, some technical issues. I do apologise to everybody um, that we got off to a shaky start, but we got there. And, um, you know, we've discussed... Um, motivation, motivating factors, structure, task structure. Um, we've discussed the triangle of physical exercise, sleep uh, and uh, diet. We've discussed um, the positive addictions and finding those islands of competence. Um, and, and hopefully people can just take that one little thing that they might just try and it might just work. Um, mm. You know, there was there's one question um, we, that is, where do you go to find out about the work that 360 and in particular Bev do? It's all on the website and there's a specific email address um, if you're interested. Um, Bev, and someone else said about trying to find a community that's not a Facebook community. Well, Bev runs communities of, of these conversations and support. Um, and we've got a complete pricing structure to meet everybody's need. Um, Bev's, Bev's very humble, but she's a national expert and a national treasure in this regard and these discussions that we have aren't structured um we just go where it's going to go we don't plan it we don't brief it we just think of a subject and go for it um i hope it's been of some use to people tonight um that's the point of us giving up the evening um susie i've just seen your message just have a look on the website all the pricing structures there and the team can help you out um and and, and have a look at things because i think one of the most important things that can happen for anybody with ADHD is having a community around you that understand you. And that, yeah. that is the biggest plus that you'll ever have. Yeah. We can discuss yeah. diet, exercise, sleep, motivation. We can discuss all the things to the cows come home. If you've got people around you who genuinely understand you, not pretending to understand you, giving you there, there, you need to be challenged by the people around you. You need to, be, you need to, you need to feel that resistance to some of your wacky ideas and be able to talk it through um mm. and 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 build that community and and we're here to help you build that community and support um uh, and we wish you all well there'll be another one of these in a few weeks um Kristen who, who's moderated for us tonight will will we'll push things out in terms of where we go with the next one um but Bev can't thank you enough as always um thank you. I think I think you're amazing it's just an absolute humbling pleasure to work alongside you and um I'll pay you later, Phil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think actually the way it works is I pay you. Um, <laughs> and and um, Kristen for moderating, yeah, moderating and pulling it all together. Uh, really grateful. Um, the unseen part of what goes on with these webinars is how hard people work to make sure it all comes off. Uh, and again, an apology for a shaky start. Kristen um, will have the link to the recording of this um, and... Um, We'll take things forward together as a team. So thank you, everybody. And um, we'll say good night.